Kingdom has wanted to start doing command school. In large part because um, you know, it was something we spent a lot more time on in the past and um, uh, in developing uh, commanders, particularly line level and mid level commanders. Um, by virtue of time and, and effort, a lot of those guys that were trained under the old system, you know, eight, five, you know, ten years ago, 15, 12 years ago, those guys are knights now, and now they've moved up into rear echelon MFs. Um, so, <laughs> got that one. So, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to develop uh, a gap now in that mid-level command space. Uh, we've, as a kingdom, we've, we've recognized that we've had other problems with line level command, and we started to address that. And, uh, and of course, that's always a work in progress. All of this always is. But our biggest gap right now seems to be in mid level command. So, as a kingdom, this is something we've wanted to do. And so, we're going to, today, we're going to kind of give you the, uh, the bird's eye view of melee combat from the perspective of a commander. Um, because I, I suspect at this point that you all have been involved in melee combat as a soldier, and in many cases, in most cases, uh, as a line level commander as well. Now I want to go back through the same stuff and talk about it from the standpoint of what your commanders are thinking, the decisions they're making, and ultimately, the decisions that we hope you guys will be making in the future. Uh, to start with, um, I want to outline the difference between strategy and tactics. Of course, I'm going to ignore this right after that, but it's important to say up front. Uh, for our purposes, strategy is the application of long-range planning and development that creates long-lasting military capabilities and advantages in your army. In other words, championships are won in the off-season, and that's strategy. Um, examples of this. If our kingdom chooses to emphasize archery, as we have for the last 20 years, and we develop archery in our kingdom such that we are superior to every other kingdom in archery, that is strategy. That is developing capabilities in our army that no one else has. If we are encouraging the use of war shields, because we're all lazy bastards and are not carrying them to wars anymore, yes, I'm talking to you. Uh, but if we elect as a kingdom to start emphasizing war shields and bringing those to war such that our army is is appropriately equipped, and in many cases better equipped than our opponents, that is creating strategic advantage that we can then use on the field. That is strategy. If our kingdom elects to emphasize spear tactics and spear training by, say, having a spear tournament twice a year that emphasizes the skills of spear dueling, that emphasizes the skills of being able to have pinpoint accuracy and hitting your targets, and being able to swing a spear for 90 minutes at a go without getting tired, such that it creates a core of spear fighters in our kingdom who have those skills, that is strategy. Those are the things that win championships in the off season. Tactics is what you do when you've been too lazy to do the homework and you need to pull something out of your ass to win on the field at that particular moment. A better, a better, less rude definition is tactics is the science of employing your available resources to achieve objectives for the application of your strategic advantages. In other words, your first one better. I see. <laughs> Pull the crap out of your ass because you didn't do the homework. That's tactics. Uh, and this is now we're down into things like talking about formation and movement and initiative. A lot of the things we're going to talk about today, because for our purposes and for 90% of the SEA, when, when they say strategy, they mean tactics. That's what we're going to talk about today. But it's important for all of you as potential commanders, commanders today, or future commanders to understand the difference and to understand that your work doesn't start when you get to Gulf Wars. That's just the last part. The work starts as soon as Gulf Wars is over to make sure that your troops are appropriately armed and armored, to make sure that they're training with those weapons that they know how to use them, uh, to make sure that we're developing uh, those the, the equipment and the skill sets to be able to do the things that our opponents can't do. Calentir, for example, um, in, in, in Gulf Wars past, um, uh, I like to call Calentir the purple pin cushion, or used to, on the field, because we shot the crap out of them. And they bring their big war shields, and their, you know, I, I, 
you know, I don't think anybody's ever seen a tournament shield in Calatier. And if they're not carrying one of those and they're carrying a pole arm or, or a great sword, and that's great for me because they get shot a lot. Um, and apparently they figured that out, and we got lazy. And two Gulf Wars ago, they came to Gulf Wars with 33 crossbows. Now, it, for reference, that's three times the, the number of archers we have in the field that year. They came to, to Gulf Wars, that one kingdom with 33 crossbows, and with enough bolts and, and, and equipment to use it. So our tactical, our strategic advantage, go on. Um, that's the kind of thing we want to prevent. So moving into uh, you know, the, the tactical realm and strategy and whatnot, I, I want to start with an overview of how things work. And then we'll talk more about what the expectations are for you as, as potential mid-level commanders. Uh, to start with, I want to talk about the structure of a typical SCA army. Um, and and uh, at some point, I'm sure Spider will get into ours specifically since he is the warlord. Of course, the crowns are always in, in uh, overall command of everything. Most crowns, nine times out of ten, will delegate that authority to the warlord because they got a, a ton of other crap going on. they got plenty of meetings already. Um, the warlord then will have, you know, whatever authority that the crown gives to them, usually complete authority over the army, both the training of and the command of the army in the field. Uh, the warlord will typ typically appoint some number of generals um, to assist him in commanding the army. Um, those generals will then have captains who work under them who sp command specific units. For example, if a warlord has uh, a left flank general, main general, right flank general, uh, reserve general, and a, a uh, cavalry commander, that main main unit general will then have, if it's composed of Oldenfeld and, uh, or excuse me, Castle, uh, the Lions, I should say, and the elements from Darkwater and from Wyvernwood, then each one of those units is going to have a captain or a commander. Inside of each one of those units, there will be sergeants who are commanding a particular line. If there's a shield wall commander, for example, he's commanding eight guys across or ten guys across. And then the next rank may have another sergeant who's commanding that. Within uh, those lines, there's likely to be uh, lance commanders or triad commanders. Within a squad of three guys or four guys, there'll be one guy who's, you know, who says, we're going that way. That's the structure of the army, you know, both down and up. Any questions so far? Excellent. The crown, warlord, the general staff, rear echelon, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Mid-level command, when we talk about that, we're talking about unit commanders, sub-unit commanders, and the, the number two, and this is a, a line that sergeants tend to straddle. Um, they, they, they tend to have some responsibilities that we would classify as mid-level command and other responsibilities we classify as low-level command. Uh, my def uh, differentiation between the three is what their responsibilities are. Line-level commanders are responsible for making sure their guys are, are, are uh, in ranks, that they are formed up appropriately, that uh, their shield lines are tight, that, you know, de depending on what they're doing, of course, but that shield lines are, right, are, are tight, pointed in the right direction, and for calling out cadences. If we're you know, marching, those are the guys that are going to be calling out the, the, the cadence so that everybody stays together. Uh, Mid-level commanders, those are the guys who are going to be responsible for looking down the field. You know, they're aware of the, of the plan. They know what, they're supposed to, what their unit is supposed to be doing. They're the guys that are going to be saying, we need our unit to go that way. They'll issue commands. The sergeants then will execute those commands, and the line uh, level commanders support that. The general staff, the REMFs, those are the guys that are going to set the plan or sometimes, sometimes not standing even further back. They have full command of, of the battlefield in terms of what they're seeing, and they're going to be making responses at a, at, a, at a large tactical level of moving entire blocks of units around to respond to what the enemy is doing or to exploit advantages. Okay. Um, most armies in the SCA are typically organized around four unit blocks or five unit blocks. Uh, I have an example of both. Um, you will have a main force. Usually it's roughly 30% 
of the Army's total troops will be in the main force. Um, for reference, we'll just put them in the, in the middle, depending on, on what you're doing. It may not be in that particular spot. But the main force, usually about 30% of the troops of the Army. There'll be a left flank and a right flank, both of which are typically around 20% of the force for the Army, and with the remainder showing up in the, uh, in the reserves. Uh, if it's a or it's only 40 percent. Uh, for a uh, army that's organized in five unit blocks, you'll have the same things. This will typically be 30 percent, 20 percent, 20 percent, 20 percent, and 10 percent in a cavalry unit. No more than that. Um, other than just breaking it down into smaller units and making it easier to move around on the battlefield, there's also uh, typically some differences between how these units are armed, armored, and what their jobs are. Uh, looking at the blue force for the moment, this left flank unit, just like you would expect if it was a person fighting, this is my torso, my left arm, and my right arm. This left flank unit should be your heaviest units because they're going to get pressed the hardest. Anybody, everybody understand why that is? Because you're facing mostly right-handed people. Exactly. Nine people out of ten are right-handed, and the other ten, you know, should go find another game. <laughs> so, so um, as a commander, I want to put strong defense in my left flank unit because I know they're going to get pressed the hardest. Conversely, my right flank unit, because all my my God fear and right handed guys are over there swinging hard. <laughs> normal people. Normal people. That's cool. So anyway, uh, for my right flank unit, I want my stronger attackers. You know, if I've got, uh, you know, if I'm looking at my mix, my mix of units, and I know that, that this particular set of guys is good at attack, I'm probably going to put them on the right flank because I want my strongest attack there because it's where my opponent is going to be. Uh, my main unit is going to be composed of, of a mix of both of those. My reserve unit, you know, it is going to be similarly mixed up. Attack. Uh, cavalry breaks every rule um, that the other guys are following. They um, frequently will, will be operating at, at loose quarters, um, sometimes no closer to each other than the spear lane. They only come together to hit a particular target, and, and as soon as that target has been engaged and either eliminated or, or they've done their job, they disperse again so that it's difficult for their opponents to apply a unit to them to contain them. Uh, skirmishers, uh, you know, they, a lot of skirmish duties, uh, cavalry units are doing, they're always running, um, they're usually outnumbered, um, they're usually scary. Uh, Gunnar's a great guy for that kind of stuff because dudes get attention. Uh, crown turning winners because crown turning winners get attention. Guys that don't play well with each other because, you know, where else are you going to put them? <laughs> so, uh, for today, we're really not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about cavalry tactics or cavalry units because that's a whole other nobody discussion. Cares. And because, you know, nobody cares. Questions so far? Great. Next, I want to talk a little bit about unit composition. Particularly one of these blocks. I'll, I'll take a 15 man unit to start with. This is a, a not unusual order of battle for a, a typical line unit. Uh, two lines of, of shieldmen and a, a line of either spears or pole arms behind that. That's not unusual. Uh, certainly not unusual for us. That's, that's uh, an order of battle we've deployed a number of times. One of the other things you're likely to see, uh, one of the things I actually prefer,
This will be a similar order of battle that's organized into triads. You notice the unit is itself composed of triads formed of two shield men, a pole arm, and a spear in the back. The important part of this stuff is that all these guys can hit the same targets. Spear can reach this, pole arm can reach that, and the sword shield can too. Similarly, these guys are going to have similarly uh, are, are going to have overlapping fields of fire, if you will. Other less so than this one. But these are common compositions for line units. There's a lot of variation, particularly depending on what kind of engagement you're, you're talking about. We'll get to that later. Um, one of the things you're going to notice I did not put in here is great swords and, and two sword guys. Um, and uh, if great sword is your favorite weapon, like it is mine, or two sword is your favorite weapon, no offense, good arm, um, but you probably want to leave that at all. They're, they're not useless because, hey, you showed up. But uh, from the standpoint of a commander, mostly what you do is get in the way. Um, looking at, at my handy dandy chart, uh, shield men have comparatively the weakest attack of the weapons forms alone. Shield men together have a relatively strong attack, particularly if they're not concerned with hitting and they're more concerned with disrupting the units that they come across. I mean, I kill them, which is why they give them a three, but they disrupt the units enough that the guys behind them have easy time to kill their opponents because now they have two to one advantages, three to one advantages because their units are broken. Comparatively, however, shields have by far the strongest defense of any weapons form on the field. Shields take territory, shields hold territory. Two weapons, on the other hand, they have a comparatively stronger attack than a sword and shield guy does because they have a weapon on either side. They pay for that by the fact that they have crappy defense, to, to be fair, you know, as opposed to really just non-existent. Pole arms have a stronger attack, um, you know, the, the two plus, in ranks with with shield men, they have a devastating attack. Um, their defense is not as good, unless they're in ranks with shield men or in ranks with each other, in which case their defense is solid. Not as good as shield, but it's still pretty good. Question so far? Okay, let's contrast that with great sword fighters. Uh, great sword fighters, or great axe fighters, it's whatever. Um, their attack is fairly powerful. Um, great swords, our kingdom accepted we, since we have butt spikes on great swords. Because they don't have butt spikes on great swords, because their grips are at the end of the weapon, they need a lot of room to fire, which means their attack is not as good as a pole arm, who can swing from better angles from, from smaller places. And they pay for that um, lack of attacking ability with particularly bad defense, particularly against pole arms and spears, great swords are meat. Spears have by far the strongest attack on the battlefield, unless they're alone, in which case they're attacking. Oh, crap, we're getting paid. Their crap is not so good. Their attack is not so good. Because a spearman is effective in a cone 30 degrees in front of them at most. If you come at them from any angle other than that, uh, they're moving around too much. It's too easy to defeat their attack and get on them and kill them. Uh, so their, their attack is very strong in this direction and very weak in any other direction. Their defense is moderately okay in this direction and non-existent anywhere else. Spear guy's defense is not very good. Unless they're in order with shield men or pole arms or their spear gods, which are in a whole different set of stuff. I'm not saying don't bring a great sword to the battlefield. I'm not saying don't bring two sword or two weapons to the battlefield. What I am saying is if you haven't one crown tourney with those weapons, leave them at home. <laughs> Satisfied? <laughs> that, that works for now, yeah. <laughs> if you can't win crown tourney with a great sword, don't bring it to the battlefield. If you can't win crown tourney with two weapons, don't bring it to the battlefield. Bring the weapons of war, pole arms, spears, sword and shield, bows, crossbows. Love to see those. Okay. I know we've all fought in them, but I, I want to talk about the types of engagements that you're going to see on the melee field. Again, this is going to be from the perspective of the commanders and the decisions that they make, the differences at a, at a at a strategic level and why that we make the decision we do on a battlefield. Uh, the first and most obvious type of engagement are open front engagements, which by way of that, what I really mean is field battles. Um, 
for our purposes, when we say open front engagement, we mean an engagement on a battlefield where the boundaries are sufficiently wide that they have no impact on the battle. Uh, recognizing that the field of Gulf Wars, there's now enough guys that it's, you know, there are elements that would, would tend us to lead to think that it's not necessarily an open field, but for our purposes, we're going to consider it to be an open front engagement. In other words, I, I have the complete freedom to run around my opponents, the, the boundaries are not a factor, etc. Um, the For the field battles, uh, because of their, their nature, usually they're not resurrection battles, which means that these things are over quickly. They're a lot of fun. Um, but in terms of the actual fighting, there's probably three minutes for fighting in a field battle. There's probably 15 minutes worth of holds, but in terms of the actual <laughs> fighting, there's yeah. probably about three minutes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, field battles uh, present the least opportunity for a commander to have an influence on the battle. You set a plan at the beginning, you may set some contingencies if they do this, then we do that, but basically the moment lay on is called, it's in the hands of, of the line level commanders and of the individual soldiers. Because you really don't have an opportunity to say, okay, now I want you to do this and do that and you know, go sideways. It's just you don't have the chance to do that. It's over too fast, and the communication lines are too long. Um, as a result of that, field battles favor uh, armies, favor units that emphasize mobility, that emphasize aggression, and that emphasize and have trained initiative into their commanders. And these are things, definitely, those three that we want you to pay attention to as a mid-level commander or potential mid-level commander in the future and develop those skills for yourself. Um, it, we talked about already that field battles are the ones that are most dependent on the individual training and the soldiers and their individual skill. Um, in terms of weapons mix, field battles favor shields and pole arms. Uh, spears are not ineffective, but um, spears are most effective in, in engagements where the pace is slower, where they're not running and firing at the same time. Than accepted. <laughs> yeah. So when we but when we meet shields, uh -huh. and, we st and we stop. That's I mean that's, that's it the, is, that's and that's an opportunity that for that's an opportunity for spears to be effective. Um, but over the over the, the, the course of the battle, it's not the whole the battle is not going to be that way. Yeah. Uh, which is why I said that if if uh, if I'm choosing, well if I'm choosing because I. I'm not a great pull on front. I'm going to take a spear anyway. But all other things being equal, and I'm coming to the field battle, I have a choice between a spear and a pole arm. I'm going to take the pole arm because I'm going to have more opportunity to do things with it than I will with the spear. Yeah. That's just me. Other questions? I, I was yes. just going to say that engagement when those two groups hit, I, I use the spear a lot and I take my shield every time to the field battle because that engagement shouldn't last long enough for me to get a full advantage with my spear. It just shouldn't. One side or the other is going to decide that in 30 seconds who's going to win that line on an engagement. And by and large, a spear is not going to change. On a, on a bridge, it's going to change a battle. In that moment, in that 30 seconds, the, even the best spearman doesn't always make enough of a difference that hard charging poles and shields will. Uh, just Unless it's just my belief. Oh, I, that. I'm with I you 100%. I believe that. For the most part, I agree with them. Uh, with my own experience in it, because it does happen so fast, we don't get a chance for it to set up. I still put pole weapons and spears at about the same range and the same level of fighting because most of it's going to be very linear if you're going and moving. Shields are doing their job and driving like they should. The poles and the spears have the opportunity to kill. Correct. If, 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 if your momentum's battle, staying the same, yes. Right. If we go into a static battle, that's when the spears have the chance to come on and shine. Absolutely. And I. Similarly, there's, you know, in breaking, uh, breaking tactics, when your units are charging through your opponents, um, that's really your, your pole arm's best opportunity to shine on the field. Immediately after a charge has happened, when the lines are disrupted, pole arms go to tank murder. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate for the other guy. And, and, it's, and you're right, when, when a line staggers and stops walking, it's a shield team's party, I mean, it's a spirit's oh, party at that point. Yeah. Uh, the problem is you find a lot of these stagnant lines standing there and there is suddenly 
no commander behind them telling them what to do, and they find themselves going, whoa, whoa hold the line, hold the line, because that's all they know what to do at that point. Well, if a line we'll is stagnant, if too. you're a part of a stagnant line, go are you going to talk about it? No, no, go ahead. Go are ahead. you going to talk about it? Uh, in general terms. No, then, then go ahead. My, my word to you is if you find yourself standing there and realizing that you're not taking ground facing off spearmen and you have no spearmen, you have a choice. You can either retreat fast or you can blow them right off the line. Don't allow those spearmen to poke at you. Buckle up, defend yourself, and cross the field. Push them off. And you know, sooner or later, somebody's going to be able to break free and just do some damage. But if you stand there, they will own you and your line will be gone. Spears attack forward, not backward. Yeah, it's full. <laughs> yep. Other questions? Okay. Um, on the other end of the spectrum from your open front is the quintessential example of a lim limited front engagement. Um, and in fact, that's the most extreme example of a limited front engagement because they're coming this way, you're going that way, and whoever gets pushed off the bridge loses. Um, in the same um, category would be the castle battle. The fort at Gulf Wars. Um, it's a little different because there's multiple portals, essentially multiple small bridges, and there's field area in between, but for our purposes we can consider that to be a limited front engagement. You can only engage the enemy from a limited area until they get a breakout. Um, the ravine, uh, one second, the ravine, um, albeit the, the boundaries are wide, uh, by virtue of the numbers on the field and the way that it's typically fought, the ravine is to be considered a limited front engagement. Uh, we have to, we engage them generally from this side. We generally are engaging from that side, recognizing the line buckles here and there, and there's opportunities for other stuff. But generally, the ravine could be considered a limited front engagement. Yeah, Gunnar. Uh, where did you classify the town battle? I'm coming to that. <laughs> Uh, so the limited front engagements, these are the ones that have the most opportunity for command control. <coughs> this is where commanders have the most opportunity to exercise decision making and where those decisions will have the most impact um, because the pace of the battle is significantly slower. Uh, half the, um, the limited front engagements also happen to be resurrection battles, which just makes that even bigger. Um, uh, these, uh, these types of battles, in terms of the skills of the individual soldiers, these emphasize discipline, discipline, more discipline. Did I mention discipline? <laughs> uh, they em emphasize unit cohesion. Um, they emphasize unit composition. Unit composition becomes particularly important in, in uh, limited front engagements. How many times have we been on bridges where all of our spearmen have been killed and we're facing even three, four spearmen on the other side? It doesn't matter when you, when you have none. Uh, and it's just, it's like shooting ducks in a barrel. It's terrible. But unit, unit composition is ex extremely important in limited front uh, engagements. Um, and <coughs> as a result of that, this is a, these types of battles are ones that favor shields. Actually, all battle types favor shields. The spears are particularly important in limited front engagements. Other questions or comments on the limited front stuff? Okay. Kind of in between. Uh, the, you know, open field or open front versus limited front is what we term the broken field engagements. These are ones where um, the boundaries uh, or the terrain is a factor, but not so much that the the enemy can only be engaged in one direction. The town is the quintessential example of a broken field. You're all familiar with the the general shape of the town. In past years, we've typically had a fairly large square. It's got a center hut and, and huts to the either in the corners or, or in a plus shape. Um, there's opportunities there to close off areas and turn areas of the battle into limited front. There's ample open spaces. There's uh, you know in you know in, uh, fighting inside the huts. Um, there are no straight lines of battle. There's um, zones of control. I guess is the best way to term it. Unlike a limited front engagement where there is a line of battle. It's easy to see. They're on this side, I'm on this side. Um, broken field engagements are the most chaotic by far um, in the SCA. Kind of like this year's uh, town battle with the bridges. And the exactly. Bridges. Which was awesome. That was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. They're the most chaotic. Um, they are the ones where you know the least. As a you know, as a soldier, but particularly as a command, you're right. Excuse me. 
Well, I happen to be a particularly big fan of the town battle last year. And, um, yeah. Perhaps if I had some say in it, we'll probably keep it in there. <laughs> uh, maybe those two weapon guys might be able to do something. <laughs> or those, you know, spear gods. And, As you wish, your, your highness, it shall be so. <laughs> Uh, as I was saying, the, the, the broken engagements are by far the most chaotic. Uh, as a soldier, particularly as a commander, you have the least information on what's going on. For your own troops, let alone for what the other guys are doing. Because you can't see. There's no line that you could look at and say, we're here and they're across. It's, well, we're doing well over here, we're getting pressed here, and I can't even see what's going on over there because there's too many guys in the way. Um, they are the ones that require the most uh, command and control, conversely, they're the ones where you have the least information. Um, as a guy fighting in those engagements, uh, you know as soldiers that you can be engaged here and then now you're suddenly engaged over there um, with little or no warning. Um, for me, that makes these battles the most fun in the SCA. The ravine is, or excuse me, the town is a good example of that. Anybody ever been to Penzik? Woods battle would be an example of a broken field engagement. By far, the, my favorite battle in the SCA no offense to Gulf Wars, but the Woods Battle at Penzig is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, these battles favor command and control. They also favor initiative. They favor um, good mid-level command because frequently <coughs> you will be operating independent of your REMFs with little or no direction other than a general plan at the start. You will get uh, communication from command to do particular things, but mostly you're left on your own to make decisions in the area that you're in, in your zone of control. Uh, so this is these are the types of battles that are, are going to demand the most of you as mid-level commanders or potential future mid-level commanders. Um, complicating the whole mix is resurrection battles, which add an element for conditioning. They also, any res battle will add discipline as a necessary skill for the soldiers because uh, res battles are frequently not won by who brought the most troops to the field, but who has the most troops left on the field at the end. Who's got the most endurance? Who's got the most endurance? Who has the most heart? Who wants the most? Yeah. Uh, if, if I could just real, real quick. To, okay, those of you that are here in this room, you are in this room because you have a higher level of interest in the army. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here right now. Right? You, 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 I look around here and I see a lot of leadership for the Trimarian Army. It is incumbent upon you to be in shape for these resurrection battles. Right? You are the leaders. Other people are looking to you. Even if, they, even if you don't think they are, everybody in here has somebody that is looking to them. And if during the, that, that ravine battle, if you're sitting with your top off drinking water, there's going to be, for every one of you in this room that do that, there'll be five other people that are doing that simply because you did it, and that makes it okay for them to do it. All right? This is when you get in shape now so that you fight the entire battle. If you need to rest, you rest on the line. Because those Anstiorans, when they look across the line, and you're standing there leaning on your spear or leaning on a shield, they don't know you're tired. They see a body and they account for it. Rest on the field, be in shape. Your grace. All I can say is that when it comes to looking up, I was embarrassed that my king ran back and forth across that damn field, dying and living, dying and living, and I could barely drag my ass from resurrection back to where I was supposed to be. For those of you that want to be inspired and that were at that war, just take a second and try to remember that picture when you were dying and you looked up and noticed that your king just ran by you again. Mm -hmm. And again. Well, and that wasn't the first or second or third or fourth time that you just did that. That is what His Grace is talking about. If you can go to that battle and you're capable of making the entire battle on a run, well, okay, if all of us can do that, they don't stand a chance. They don't even need to bother to come out. It's just that simple. But since that's not going to be the case, we can all strive to at least be somewhere in the middle. We should try. Well, uh, I, I agree, you're right. Coming back to... Um, uh, well, the ravine to the broken stuff from that. Um, of the battles we've talked about, there's the open field engagements, the field battles. There's the limited front stuff, the town, the bridge, excuse me, um, the bridge, the ravine, and the fort. 
And then there's the broken field engagements, the ravine, the woods battle here at Penzing. Um, I personally, the, the field battles are near and dear to my heart. But of all those engagements, one of them is the field. All, and one of them demands that particular skill set and that particular <coughs> configuration for the Army. Because now let's take, it, take those things we just talked about and look at them from the perspective of the commander. On the field, I want a lot of shields. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I'm more concerned with bringing shields that people can fight with while they're moving than I am with bring, than bringing shields that they can fight with and have the best defense. So I am, I am, while I always want people to bring more shields, if they're going to bring shields that are a little smaller, I'd rather do it to the field. Um, I want them to bring weapons that they can swing with because after the engagement, units will break up, you'll have opportunity to swing your stick, and then you're going to re to reform and come back. Every other battle we've talked about, every other battle we've talked about, if there's a shield, I'd like to see them bring in a war shield. I'd like them to bring the best defense they can possibly bring. Um, because their opportunities to kill are not nearly as important to me as their opportunities to hold territory. Every other engagement but the field is about holding ground. <coughs> and shields are the best at holding ground. So if a shieldman comes to the battle, I want them to bring the best shield that they can bring. If they have a weapon in their other hand, that's a bonus to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Ask any commander in here. If they have a weapon, that's great, but I care less about that than the fact that they have a good shield and good defense. Because to be honest, a good shield with a, a unit of guys is its own offense. Yeah. If the shieldman lives through the battle, he's won the battle. It yeah. doesn't matter if he kills. If he lives through the battle, he's won that battle. Have you pull on to each shieldman in front of him. Yeah. One shieldman, even if he's a, 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 a pretty damn good shieldman, you know, with a sword, the, the tourney stick he really likes, you know, in the grand scheme of things, his offense is pretty good. Um, two shieldmen, meh. Um, ten shieldmen? Uh, you know, who cares what their, shield, their swords are like because... Ten shieldmen hitting something is going to knock some people on their ass. And at that point, you know, great. You know, you can kill them with a, with a butter knife if you got one. Um, but the fact that they're laying down is the important part. And the fact that they're not attacking you and not attacking your friends is the most important part. Yeah. If you have a shield and you're in that line, and you have a pole arm of any kind, spear, blade, whatever behind you, you should be concentrating more on defense than any kind of offense at all. Because if you start swinging, you are now deflecting, blocking your own guys from being able to attack and from defending yeah. as you can bind up their weapon and cause them to be killed by somebody else. Exactly. So, we have one set of, of engagements, the field battles, you know, that essentially have one configuration of weapons and, and people. Every other battle we do swings the other way. We want best defense, we want spearmen, we want pole arms, particularly those, you know, good spearmen who have trained, who have been in the spear tournament and have developed the stamina to be able to swing the spear for 90 minutes without getting tired. It's, it's not an accident we have a spear tournament. That's why we have it, is to develop those skills in our spear. Um, as a commander, then, it is your job to make sure that the troops that you command are bringing the correct weapons to the particular fight that they're having. It's your job to do what you can to make sure that they own the correct weapons, or that your group owns the correct weapons that they can loan to them, if that's how things work for you guys. Glaive, seven and a half feet, not five, six. six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you speak your definition of what the dimensions are for a uh, war shield? Um, my definition of, of the dimensions on a war shield are whatever the warlord tells me the definition of how that is. When I was warlord, my definition was two and a half feet wide and four feet tall. Uh, I don't know what spiders is going to be, but whatever it is, I'll go make one the next week. Yeah, uh, if, so if you're going to make something to take to the war as a hand weapon and you're going to be a shieldman, I personally think a hand axe with a basket hilt is the most effective uh, weapon that a shieldman can have in a war. I do not disagree with that at all. I think that that, that is entirely accurate. Um, in in combination with that, the other thing I love to see uh, Shieldman bring to the field is a thrusting tip. 
I hate those damn things for the most part, to be honest. But in a, in a melee situation, particularly when in the press, where you don't have the room to swing, you almost always have the room to thrust. There was one point um, in, the, uh, in the bridge, I think, where we press shield to shield, where I turn my sword over so it's pointed like this, and I've got this tip out this way, and the guys can't even move. They can see it coming. They can't do anything about it. And I'm stuck in the <laughs> It's pretty bad. I mean, it, you, you kind of feel like a criminal. <laughs> Your favorite criminal. Kind of like a long dagger. Kind of like a long dagger. And there's a reason why, you know, the most effective infantry army ever, the Romans, fought with gladiuses. And there's a reason why they trained them not to swing them. They trained them to thrust with them. Because they work. In regards to the great point about axes, if you're going to bring an axe to the war, then you recommend, first of all, you reinforce it so you hook something, and then just flop over. And you can do that by putting reinforce in the right places. But also, have a, have a rattan edge on it. Fighters, when they're heated, you got to thump them anyway to get their attention. And in, in a melee and battle, they're being jostled. So it's hard for a guy to go down unless he knows he's been killed. And actually, some force about it will get his attention. But they're also used to hearing that clack, feeling that clack. And the rubber, it, unless you really knock them down, a lot of them don't, it doesn't register. They're not really being thick, but they've been trained. You know, they know what rattan feels like. They know what rattan against the helmet feels like. They know the sound. You put an edging on your ax, it doubles effectiveness because you get the weight to mass and also the clack. They know they've been hit. That was me. And they'll go down faster. Just a point. So, the difference, coming back to you as commanders or potential commanders, you want to make sure that your troops are coming to the field with the correct equipment. Equipment they know how to use. If they don't know how to use it, they should leave it at home. And that includes big shields. If they can't use one, bring a smaller one. Yeah. We'll find a place for them somewhere else. Um, they should come to the field uh, understanding the rules of engagement for what they're doing. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. There's a whole thing on communication. But make sure that your troops are prepared. That's your job as a mid-level commander, a job you didn't necessarily have as a line-level commander or as a soldier. Um, the other thing that, that we're looking for from you as a mid-level commander is to understand what the, the role of your unit and the role of uh, 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 your unit within that flank and what your flank is doing in, in regards to the entire plan. Um, if, you're, if your unit is part of this left flank, then you understand going in that your unit is going to be called upon to be defensive, usually. They're going to be hit hard, they're going to be hit a lot, because you're likely going to be facing the, the, the best offense of your opponents, and you guys need to understand that going in and know that they're going to need to defend themselves vigorously. Um, if your guys are in the right flank unit, you guys need to understand that they must be aggressive, and that's your job to reinforce that to them. They have to be aggressive because if they're not, that just means that, that all of your friends, all of your, your brothers in arms, are spending more time facing their opponents than they need to because you're not doing your job punching through and creating opportunities for them and taking pressure off of them. Because nobody likes to stand there and get swung at by, uh, by superior forces. And, I mean, the specifics of it will, will happen on a battle-by-battle -battle basis. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But it's important for you as a mid-level commander to understand what your role is, to understand what the role of your unit is, to make sure that your guys understand that and are prepared to execute that. Okay, um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about typical um, strategies that are employed in SCA combat. And there's basically five. Um, these would apply to open field engagements. They would apply in lesser degree to uh, degree to broken field engagements. There's uh, other ones that apply to limited front. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the most basic uh, strategy employed in the field, and the one that actually is employed the least, is the frontal assault, or as we like to call it here in Trimeras, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, was great. that involves everybody go forward, everybody swing sticks, um, you know, close them until they're dead. Um, this is a, uh, in strategic terms, this is something that you 
may employ when you have numerical superiority over your opponent, and time is not your friend. When you need to win, you need to win quickly, uh, and you're willing to spend your troops to do so, frontal assault is one way to do that. Um, in practice, I recommend you almost never do this by itself. It's but it's there. one of the most basic strategies that can be employed. Uh, questions so far? Okay. Next. is single envelopment, or as we term it in Trimeris, hammer and anvil. If you guess that the anvil is the left flank, then you guess correctly. The left flank and the mid and the right flank will execute pinning attacks on their opponents. They will advance to engagement, they'll engage their opponents, and they'll press them. The reserve forces will come around doing a uh, single uh, envelopment to the right. The uh, reserve forces will swing around their opponents, um, avoiding engagement until they reach um, the rear of the, of the uh, or the side at the very least, of the right flank unit on the opposing side, and then they will turn to engage. Um, all of these tactics, once we've gotten past frontal assault, all of these tactics are designed to create numerical superiority at the point of engagement. Um, does anybody know, not know what that means? There's no trick question here. I mean, it's, it's, if you don't know what that means, please speak up. Great. Well, you guys get a star. <laughs> so, <laughs> properly executed, what that looks like is I get my reserve block has moved into here. What is more likely going to happen is my opponent's right flank will start to to bend backwards so they don't present a side or a back uh, to the uh, to my flanking units. And now our battle line now looks like, which allows me to put more weapons on my opponent than they can put on me. So we got 50% uh, uh, of the engagements are one-on-one, -on -one, the other 50% are two-on-one, -on -one, which I'm gonna win. Uh, they start dying, we start winning. They all die, we have beer, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> slow to react to the guys coming around because they're carrying those big shields and the pole arms. Darn that. So, yeah, that, that's terrible, terrible. I <laughs> um, part and, and parcel with the single envelopment is double envelopment. This involves essentially splitting your reserve force in half. Everything else is the same. The, the, the three front line units are going to advance to engage and pin their opponents. Half the reserve force is going to come around one side. Half the reserve force is going to come around the other side. Horns of the buffalo, horns of the bull, other ways that we've commonly referred to it here. Um, <laughs> the advanced form of get yeah. The advanced form of get Again, looking at it from the standpoint of our lines of engagement, This allows me to put more weapons on my opponent than they can put on me. Same principle. This one is harder to execute than single envelopment. Um, the key part for in single envelopment is that your the, the flanking force swing wide enough that they do not engage their opponent. They need to stay close enough that they can get there quickly because while they're maneuvering, the three line units in the front are going to be outnumbered. Assuming that the, the sides have similar numbers, um, they'll have more during that time when the flankers are moving. When they re-engage, you'll have numerical superiority where they hit, which will quickly turn into numerical superiority, superiority across the field, assuming everything goes well. But until then, they're outnumbered, meaning that the flanking unit needs to move fairly quickly. In, uh, in a double envelopment, you have twice the problem because you have two forces um, that now are, are swinging wide. So not only do, does the left flank, uh, the flanking unit on the left, 
need to swing wide enough but not too wide, but the right flanking unit needs to do the same thing, and ideally they need to hit at the same time. Um, so that, they are, that your opponent don't get a chance to respond to one, deal with it, and then go respond to the other one. Because at that point what you've done is given them the numerical superiority twice, which is not so good. <laughs> No beer. <laughs> no, no beer. beer. No beer. No, no beer for you. No beer bad. Yeah. So this is more difficult to execute, but done well, this pincer movement is much more difficult to defend against. Questions? This is working off the assumption that their reserve unit is also not splitting around like ours. Or counter. Or if they are splitting around single envelopment, do we just end up in a single envelopment with half the bars or four speed? Well, players? for every move there's a counter. Every move has a counter. For every counter there's a move. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> typically what you're going to see in a single envelopment is, yeah, the reserve units are not going to stand still. Um, as a commander, this is one of those areas where I don't want to deploy my cavalry um, to get on, to pin the, um, my opponent's reserve. Or conversely, if, if the circumstances work out that way, Frequently, the cavalry commander can uh, execute the flank while the reserves are essentially meeting and, and static. Uh, I only need numerical, numerical superiority for a short period of time in order for it to be effective. If I get uh, 20 seconds, for almost forever in a field out, if I get 20 seconds of numerical superiority, uh, that creates more numerical because I'm, you know, in that 20 seconds, every, you know, in the areas where I have it, I'm killing a lot of guys which creates more numeric. It's like it, it opens like a zipper. I mean, once it starts, you know, on this side, when this unit starts to turn, that's all I need. That's all I need. Because once they do, when they present that, one, they're weak. Uh, because not all the shields are pointing in the same direction. Which means that these guys now who are pressing on them are not meeting the resistance they were meeting before. I'm putting more weapons on my opponents than they're putting on me. And every third engagement down the line, I'm likely to win. And I'm likely to win relatively quick, quickly, which means it just, you know, as they start to turn, as they start to die off, it just goes faster and faster and faster until it's over. Um, that's why once it starts, um, if it's well executed, it's difficult to stop as the opponent. Um, reserve guys will be like when these guys are coming through, and I see that coming happening to me, I want to want to apply my reserves reserves as quickly as I can to stop that flank. Um, and if I can. I'll stop the flank and I'll come back around myself um, once we, we've done that and then do the same thing that they were trying to do us. And the double envelopment, um, what you're likely to see is that the reserve unit will engage one of my flank sides. My other one will, will uh, uh, be shoot ducks in the barrel. I mean, it's, it's criminal. It's, it's, it's terrible. So, you so instead of getting the double envelopment, I'm still going to get the double envelopment because remember, when these guys come around, they're good. You know, at best case scenario, they're going to be here, and I still have more frontage. Yeah, but you're meeting their reserves there, and you end up with a single envelopment that will lead to a double envelopment. Um, you can think of it that way. Um, if you know, if if the opponent's reserves commit to one side, which is usually what happens, um, well, more or less, that's usually what happens. The guys that meet no resistance go to town, they'll feel that. Um, they'll smash the back of this unit or the side of that unit, brush off of that, that starts this zipper going, then they'll hit the back of this unit, which opens up the main. And really this one grinds down to static because as the flanking force, when I meet that reserve force, I'm like, okay, we have lost the initiative, so now I'm just trying not to die. If I'm not winning, if I'm, as a defender in a field battle, if I am outnumbered and I can't get a uh, tactical advantage by maneuver, but I want the engagement to go as long as I possibly can. I don't care about killing you, I just care about not getting killed, because if I'm outnumbered here, the odds are pretty good that I outnumber you somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But if my friends can go kill your friends faster than you can kill me, then they'll come back and help me. So if I'm outnumbered, I just want to defend. Then we have beer. <laughs> All right, one of, actually not one of, my personal favorite strategy on the field. Um, I apologize for not having a better name for it. Um, 
Uh, this is a uh, attack on oblique, as I call it. Or, or my personal favorite term for it is the NASCAR strategy. Okay, let's go again. <laughs> this involves, you know, matching up my opponents, you know, in screening attacks, and then a really strong right hook. Um, my right flank units will be, will be, you know, not just you know, engaging and fighting, but they will be punching through, pushing this back to create an opportunity for the reserve to come in and turn left. I call this the NASCAR strategy because it involves go fast. Turn left. <laughs> if it gets in your way, put it in the wall. <laughs> That's fine. So these guys are driving through. Reserve is going to be going through this way as it turns. The cavalry will be hitting the back left corner of that to start the turn. Um, this is this particular attack is particularly good if there's a boundary here that your opponents can't. Pass. Uh, edge of the world. Edge of the world. Uh, edge of the castle if you're outside of it, etc. Uh, it's also particularly good if you know that this right flank unit you know, on your opponent's side is weak. Because they can blow through and then it, it, you win quickly. One of the other ones that uh, our army has employed a number of times, um, uh, particularly when we're outnumbered. Is this refused front? Um, typically, defense actually in the field or, or uh, Baldar's defense, as I call it. <coughs> um, it essentially involves making a cup uh, from the attacking forces to come into. Archers are sitting in here in the, in the field battles, giving them maximum opportunities to fire at the opponents. Um, it works more or less just like it does with the cup in the uh, limited front stuff. So we don't have more things. Uh, it involves having blocks of, of sword and shield on either side of the, of the bridge or the core or whatever you're defending. The commander will be in the middle, typically supported by maybe a couple of shields, a couple of pole arms for sure, and himself, and a spearman in front of that. Um, we're a particularly good spear kingdom, so this one works for us a lot. Spearmen do a lot of killing. When charges are coming, we have funnels for them to get out. We have pole arm men who are not going to block spearmen from escaping. The shieldmen do that a lot. <laughs> we should train them not to do that. Gotta open the door. Let this open the door, let the spearmen back in. But in the meantime, if pole arm guys here, when those charges come, the spearmen escape, the pole arm guys will not get in their way as they step forward to throw shots into the charge and blunt it, which gives these guys the 10 seconds they need to escape and the 10 seconds that these other shieldmen had need to close the door and these guys to advance. And then, you know, when they get attacked, it essentially looks like a cub in the middle of the bridge. Then you get an opportunity to reset. That's one that we've used a number of times to good effect. Questions on that? Okay. Um, another common one that we've used on offense and defense is, uh, yeah. Just one question with that. Uh, two years ago at Gulf Wars, the bridge just stopped. Spear guys were just playing with each other, and it was like 20 minutes of them just playing with each other. No uh, one's advancing either way. I mean, is that just discipline and stalemate? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I say li limited front engagements demand the most discipline from your troops. Because as a shield guy, it's boring as hell. Mm -hmm. Pardon my language. Um, it looks like nothing's going on, but there's a whole lot going on. Yeah, What's happening is spearmen are getting killed. And that's what we're looking for. It's um, in, this, in this case, you can think of spearmen in a limited front engagement like air, air power. Right. And the first thing you want to do is establish air superiority. Yep. So we're killing off their spearmen. Or if it's well, like not good, they're killing off ours. But we're killing off their spearmen. And that's what's happening, even though the lines are not moving much, the spearmen are getting killed off. We're treating them. And at a certain point, we will gain superiority, and then we'll start killing their, their shieldmen with our spears. Yeah. 
minor change from a couple years ago is they are using archery on the bridges now. Oh, okay. That is going to change that up so it won't be just a spear duel for the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're still going to need the shields to be active and be ready to go at any point in time because oh. of that. That's cool. You're right. Mm -hmm. Remember that. That's a whole new level of craziness. <laughs> I don't have a good name for it, so I call it the Gaston defense, because <laughs> uh, Gaston is the first guy I learned it from. Uh, this involves having an echelon wall anchored off one side of the bridge in a diagonal back towards this spot. It's not in the center. I want it off to the side. And I typically only want two guys on this, and there's another echelon wall off the other side. Further back, you notice this is not as far forward as, the, as these guys are, just two guys. <laughs> to essentially create a funnel, put a funnel off to one end. That's important, we'll, we'll, we'll cover why in another, uh, another time, but it's important that this, the, the mouth of the funnel be off to one side. Uh, spearmen are actually <coughs> operating up here and they have a significant amount of room to go back and forth, to reposition themselves, um, to be able to, to jump back and then leap forward, etc. But it's equally important that nobody get in here and get nowhere. Um, this is one of the, the, the Offenses that's designed around the fact that our spearmen are generally better than everybody else's. Um, this gives them maximum opportunity to do damage, and it's this way. So the spearmen behind the line of this. Yeah. And um, typically, my this? my commander is probably going to be standing right there. The reason this works is because uh, we want to give our spearmen an opportunity to fight, and and to be able to do that and not get crossed, etc. This gives them maximum opportunity to do that. As they get pressed. They will back down the funnel. They'll back guys out if they need to, to to limit the number of guys. And as our opponents press here, they are funneled this way. They're, so the one, they don't get to attack in a straight line down the bridge. As they hit there, they hit the shield. Because the shield is not straight, when they bounce off, they bounce off this way. So they get concentrated. Notice we have pole arms standing between the shield guys right there to throw over that gap as they bounce off and roll this way. So they're getting hit the whole way down this, they're getting concentrated down into this funnel here. And there's actually pole arm here, pole arm here, so that the guys that do get into that chopstick. You know, chop suey, chop suey, chop suey, et cetera, and so forth. Takamatsu's having a field day. <laughs> yeah. Now the next one. Style. Yeah. Are the shield men on their knees? I hate that. I, that's why I I'm asking because usually with uh, glade men fighting over us, shield men want to be lower so that the glade men have uh, better range. I hate I would rather see guys that are crouched. Just squat. And brace. Okay. That's when else little people come yeah. in. Yeah. And you really only, I mean, cause, I mean, I've had five knee surgeries, so I recognize that's a thing. Yeah. But I really only need to do that, you know, when they're charging. If they're not charging, I can stand up. But when they're charging me, I want to be crouched and braced. And pull arms generally have plenty of room to throw over me. The other um, big thing you're going to see us do and see our opponents do on the bridge is barely worth drawing because everybody knows what it is, and that is the cup defense off the end. Um, completely defensive. You've seated all of the bridge to your opponents, and you're trying to make them pay for getting off the bridge. And, yep. And the danger, of course, is if your opponent gets enough momentum and enough mass, what they're shooting for, what I would do if I were them, is I'm looking for a breakout on one end. Yeah. Uh, typically, I'm actually going to look for the breakout on this end because I'm right-handed. Yep. So my defense is towards the shields. I'm going to try to break here and spin around. Yeah. It, it, it seems that if you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, if the object of your particular battle is to keep the bridge, the cup is useless, you've already lost. If the object is to defend the area behind the bridges in a town battle, then the cup would be very useful. Right. Or if you have multiple bridges where you need to stop a breakout on this one because it'll, it'll destroy the integrity of the other bridges, that's another place where you use the cup. And frequently, you'll actually see if we've got three bridges and the, the wind is holding two of them, we may give up one of the bridges, just put a cup on it and concentrate on the other two. 
because it ties the troops all the way down that bridge. Exactly. Because to take that, to, to defeat the cop off the end of the bridge, in order to be sure you're going to do it, you really need two and a half to one numbers. To really make sure you need three to one. Any less than that, there's no, you can't guarantee yourself you're going to get off. Um, so that ties up a lot of guys on that particular bridge. And then I can concentrate my forces on the other ones that they're also trying to attack. Um, I, I want to at least, though, hit the highlights because I think they're important to say twice or three times or four times. Um, number one is communication. Uh, how many times have you, as soldiers, been on the field after the battle going, man, I don't know what the hell we were supposed to be doing. I don't know what was going on. I mean, raise your hands. I'm, I'm curious. How many times have you been in that position? Oh, keep them up. Keep them up. How many times have you guys been in that position? Every one of you that's got your hand up at one time or another has been failed by a commander, if you can say that. Um, your job as a mid-level commander is to make sure that every one of your troops understands the plan, understands what their job is and what the job of the unit is. Because the number one thing we tell you is if you get killed, or if your commander gets killed, and you look around and you can't find the guy in charge, then you're in charge. <laughs> and if you're in charge, you better know what the hell's going on. So you need to know the plan. And ultimately, that means everybody needs to know the plan, at least in the broad strokes. As Foro was saying, we don't necessarily need to give away state secrets, but everybody needs to understand what the job of your unit is, what the, the job of the unit is in, in relation to the entire army, so that if your commanders get killed, you know what to do. It also make people just feel better to know, I understand what I'm doing, and even though I may be getting pounded on because I'm in that left flank, and I, you know, we're the guys that are going to be the anvil and getting taking that hit, I understand that it's for a purpose. It's not just because I'm getting pounded on and it's never going to end. I'm doing it for a reason, and I'm helping my army by holding this territory, and my, my friends are coming around to hit them from the other side, and we're going to win because I'm standing here getting pounded on. That's a whole lot better than my guys have forgotten me. I'm standing here getting pounded on. Why am I standing here when nobody is helping me? It's a whole lot better than that. Yeah, because that does suck. Gunnar's about to, to cut me off, so let me go yeah. quick here. Um, the other thing with communication is communicating to your to your guys the expectations of the commanders, your expectation as their commander, and what they can expect from you. It's a two-way street. Um, battlefield awareness. This is a skill that, unfortunately, you're going to have to develop on the field. Um, one of the other things that differentiates a line commander from a mid-level commander and a mid-level commander from the general staff is how much of the battlefield you see at any particular moment. As a soldier, I see the guy in front of me. If I'm paying attention, I see the guys next to him because I'm looking for a spear shot. As a line commander, I'm looking to see what's going to threaten my guys that are in front of me. As a mid-level commander, I'm saying, where are the units around me? You notice my hands are getting farther apart as I go up the chain. Where are the units around me? What's going to threaten me? Or where are the opportunities? for my unit to do damage to the opponent. And as a general, you're responsible for being able to look at everything on the field and understand where your troops are, where your opponent's troops are, where they're weak, where you're strong, and how you can exploit that to the extent that you can. Um, so that's a skill that we want you to develop. Initiative. Um, the number one thing I learned from my grand knight, for all, was that a violent, uh, plan, even a crappy violent plan, executed violently, <laughs> will almost always overcome a brilliant plan executed timidly or half a second too. <laughs> Violence. Violence good. Violence and beer. Violence and beer. Violence initiative. Because if, you're, if your opponents, physically or mentally, if your opponents are on their heels, they're not attacking you. Always good. Better to drink their beer than yours. Huh. Ah. Ah. Preparation. Championships are won in the off season. As commanders, you're going to have a better time. Your guys are going to have a better time. If you make sure that they have the correct equipment, if you make sure that they have fire support, your units could be sponsoring an archer. I know that that uh, that you know I do. I know there's a couple other guys in the room that do, and I think we all should. You know, find it. Find one of your, your folks that doesn't normally do it, 
Buy him a crossbow. I've got one. Yeah. Do all that stuff. Um, training. Yeah, training. Um, if you have spearmen, make sure that they're they're using those spears. Encourage them to fight. Leadership is your responsibility. Morale for your troops is your responsibility. Beer. Beer. Yeah. It's, it's got to be a family show. It's got to be so. a battle cry. Get a battle you're cry. Losing, <laughs> you're losing. Whatever makes us leader. Beer. 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 Beer.